So one more follow-up there, at least, Tucker. So um, look, in terms of do we need the immigrants now and what cycle are we in history in, in America, well, a couple of southern states took away, uh, did some raids, took away uh, some undocumented immigrants, and then they panicked because nobody came and took the jobs, whether it was farming or warehouses and factories, et cetera. And so then they had to change the law and say, okay, never mind, they can come back in. So that happened a couple of years ago, and we've seen that. So obviously, the, and there's actually a great number of examples of that in the country, obviously there is some need for those workers. So when I see those Latin American workers that have come in, I see the same faces uh, as the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and all the others that came in very poor, but that made this country much, much richer in the end. And so when, Tucker, when you say the word demographics, I think that is what makes people go, hmm, what does that mean? And so I genuinely want to ask you about that. So you, you did a story about Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and you were worried that the demographics of that town was changing. Why? Why are you worried about it? Because change is really hard. I mean, look at, and I'll address the first part, I think, more interesting part of what you just said in just a second. But to the demographic question, let me just say out front, I don't ever speak in dog whistles because I can say whatever I want, and I always do. So I, so I appreciate the question because I'm often attacked on the basis of, you know, maybe something, and it, it's probably my fault for not explaining whatever it was fully, but let me just say, nothing is in code, okay? <laughs> it's all right out there. And my core concern is change and the pace of change because I don't think that people are hardwired for it. And so you have a group, homo sapiens, that have lived a certain way for only like 10,000 years, not a big deal, hand to mouth agrarian society, boom, the machine age happens with the invention of the steam engine, something totally different, causes massive displacement, revolutions around the world, half the world is enslaved by communism for 70 years in reaction to it, and you kind of catch your breath, and then you have this thing called the digital revolution, which totally changes everything again. And so one of my main, maybe my overriding concern after the wage question, is how much change can people handle, actually, before they go crazy? And there's a lot of study on this. Robert Putnam at Harvard, who's hardly a right winger, has the bowling alone guy, has done a lot of really interesting study on this. Again, he's a liberal, but an honest one. And he's like, people, when they feel threatened, when things have changed too much, they get really angry and tribal, and they don't trust other people, and civic institutions collapse. And we're seeing this across the country. So there's a huge cost to changing everything up for the benefit of the few. And let me tie that to the first part of your question, which was, you said, in the South, there were raids on chicken plants, Tyson chicken plants. And the I, you know, INS or ICE or whatever we're calling it now comes in and says, you know, these people are here illegally without documentation. We're enforcing the law for once. And they couldn't find labor. Well, who is they? Well, they is the chicken plants. They is the employer. Okay. And they couldn't find labor because they didn't want to pay market rates to Americans. So basically what they're saying is, even though we're in the United States, we're a company in the United States. And by the way, you can say this of Amazon and Walmart for sure and McDonald's and lots of other big corporations that the right has defended for many years, unfortunately, and now the left defends bizarrely. They benefit from all the institutions that make business possible, the rule of law, patents, like all the things that we have that other people don't have, okay? And yet they feel like paying the wages of Tegucigalpa. Because why wouldn't they? They're an employer. What bothers me is that no one ever calls them out on it. So like you often hear people say, well, who's going to pick the lettuce or whatever? And I'm not slagging lettuce pickers. I respect anybody who works with his hands in the sun, of course. But it's not about the picker. It's about his employer. So lettuce might cost, you know, four bucks a head. Okay. Well, an iPhone cost a thousand because like actually things have costs because they have value because labor has value, duh. So I guess my question is, when did liberals all become libertarian economists who are lecturing me about the market and how one thing we can't do is get in the way of employers finding the cheapest possible labor? What? When did you start defending this? And the answer, of course, is that big companies figured out the game. And they're like, for a very small price, we can buy the allegiance of the Democratic Party. All we have to do is fund their nonprofits, which they do, but more importantly, make a series of totally hollow symbolic gestures, like here's some new bathrooms, I'm for Black Lives Matter, leave me alone. And they have totally convinced your average college student 
that they're the, the cutting edge of the progressive movement. And so you see this really weird thing that always blows my mind. You go into an Apple store, and shamefully, I own Apple products, and you'll walk in and there'll be like some highly educated, you know, kid with two degrees from impressive schools with a nose ring, standing in this kind of sad spare retail space wearing a matching uniform thinking he's part of the revolution. And I'm like, dude, you're working for the richest man in the world. Like, you're just a cog in a machine. You're a tool, actually. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm picking up, oh, oh, yeah, whatever. But I always think, like, the level of delusion that they've pulled off convincing the left, like, don't criticize suicides at Foxconn factories because, hey, you know, we got you on the dumb social issues that don't mean anything. And they fall for it. It's hilarious. Yeah. All right. So, Tucker might be referring to uh, some corporate Democrats, et cetera, but anybody that watches The Young Turks knows we criticize big business plenty. Good and, for you. Yeah. Good for you. And so, so, I mean, to use the same Apple example, uh, Apple makes a nice phone. I have one. Uh, but that doesn't mean they should pay 0% in taxes. And, uh, and they... Exactly. They, Let me just... Amen. Yes. And so they evade taxes all the time. And if you want to uh, get together and enforce the law against big businesses, I'm right there with you. Okay? So that would be wonderful. That would be a nice change uh, from what we have in the Republican and Democratic Party today. But uh, one, one more thing on immigration, Tucker. So uh, you say demographic change is scary and, and uh, can be disconcerting. And I think that a lot of people don't see that. I don't see it. Uh, a lot of people in our audience don't see it. And so they wonder why folks are, are so scared. And so they, well, it, it, I, I literally don't know the answer to that. If you're saying crime, it's not yeah. crime. As we talked about before, I can give you more stats, 110% increase in immigration since 1980. Crime in the country has gone down 36%. Okay, and in the cities where you have the most undocumented immigrants, you have the least amount of crime. And, and, and in fact, studies have taken out other factors, including poverty, and they still see that undocumented immigrants lead to less crime, not higher crime. Okay, so that's just a fact. That's a fact. So then I don't know what you're scared about. And, and, and Tucker, look, you're against, uh, as far as I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you call chain migration, what others call family migration. And so that is, as you acknowledge, the majority of legal migration. You're also against the lottery. And you do the math on that, and you have eliminated 85% of legal immigrants. But the country is massively, as you just stated, in favor of immigration. So. If you're against undocumented immigrants and you're against legal immigrants and you cite fear and demography, can you see why people then would be concerned that it's racial and not based on crime or any other legitimate factor? I guess. I, I mean, in, in my case, I mean, I don't want to be defensive or anything. I don't think I really am very defensive, but I don't actually think that there's a real, de I mean, look, I, appreci I sincerely appreciate this because I, I like an actual adult debate with a smart person about this, but I see that so rarely. Instead, I see people coming to the conversation convinced of their own virtue, and you don't actually, so it, it's a very simple way to write people off. I'm grateful for a chance to say in public what I really think about the effects of change. I think it's really disconcerting, and let me just make a point that is too rarely made. And that is that if you have a big, diverse country like this, 320 million people, no majority of anything, right, in the country, and you're running it, or you're sort of in, try, seeking to influence people who run it, like you and I are, then you really have to think about, like, what are the most important questions? Do countries hang together just through inertia just because they do? No, they don't, actually. Countries tend to sort of break apart. They sp spin out into component parts. It's, you know, it's the story of history. And so what do you need in a country where nobody, no overwhelming majority has really anything in common. Well, what you need is a unifying culture, actually. A set of ideas. This is very obvious. This is not like, you know what I mean? This is, this is not applied physics, okay? It's super simple. It's true in your life. If you have, like, nothing in common with your spouse, does it make your marriage stronger? Like, we don't even speak the same language. We love each other more. For, you know, please. It, it's not true of businesses or military. It's not true of anything because it's just not true. So it's not an insurmountable problem. And we've had this. This is not the first time we've thought about this in the history of the country. We thought about it a lot during the progressive era. What do we all have in common? And at the time, we decided, well, we have our founding documents, the Bill of Rights, 
we have patriotism, we have English. And so those are the three, and I think it's sort of perfectly great set. Maybe you've got other ideas, okay? The point is not what are those things, the question is you must have those things. And if you don't, you're gonna break apart. And maybe not now, but at some point you will because why wouldn't you? So I would argue that the very idea of multiculturalism is insane as an organizing principle of a country. Not because I'm against, hold on, not, not, not because I'm against other cultures. I, my favorite thing is to travel and go to different cultures. I think they're super interesting and a lot of them are great, maybe some better than ours. That's not the point I'm making. I'm saying as an organizing principle of your country, you need to have a common culture. Another word, another word for a collective set of beliefs. And I sincerely think, just based on being a lot of places around the world, that language is a key part of that. And that used to be, you keep referring to our earlier wave of big wave, the industrial wave of immigration that we had, the key thing that we demanded was fluency in English, key. Not because we were English chauvinist, English is not a racial category. It's a language shared by people of all kinds of different cultures. It's the language of Nigeria, okay? It's just a language. But language is the thing that holds more than anything else. And ask anybody who grew up in a multilingual country, how about a Canadian, not that far away, what happens when you have competing languages? You have inherently division. This is not, slow down, this is not a Republican or Democrat or right wing or left wing issue. It's a total common sense issue that has been obscured for reasons I honestly don't understand, maybe by demagogues on both sides, but it doesn't matter, it's true. So if you're gonna have huge country changing levels of immigration, comma, and we do, comma, you need to make absolutely certain that everybody of every color and every religion is united in at least something beginning with language. Duh. So, Steve, so, sorry. What, what, yeah. So, I, I think this goes to the core of the issue, and I think this is a really interesting conversation. And, and so, look, on, on here, on English, uh, I, I might not be as doctrinarian as, as you think. I, I came here with not knowing any words. Uh, I knew three English words. When how, I was how old eight, were you? I was eight years old, and I knew yes, no, and girl. Uh, that's it. And, uh, and they threw me into the deep uh, end, and, uh, and I did not do English as a second language, and you pick it up quickly. And, so I, I get that we have to have a unifying language. India has a unifying language. It's also English. And so I think that there is a reasonable way to do that. I don't think that you have to throw everybody into the deep end, especially if they didn't come at the age of eight. And everybody has a different perspective, and there's a way of easing into that. But when we talk about culture, well, America's culture is not unicultural. It is, by definition, multicultural. That is our culture. So, I mean, Look at all the things that we consider really American. Pizza, Italian, right? Uh, jazz, African American. And I, and I can go on and on, especially in the food category. So, and you famously, Tucker, the other day said that tacos are American and not Mexican. Yes, they are, that's right. the point. Yes. We've brought them in, they're part of American culture now, that's the point. But Tucker, that's my point. But think about it, Tucker, that we brought all those things in yes. And they are now part of our multicultural culture. Okay, so, look, per, perhaps, you know, we're, we're having a debate over word definitions or perhaps my verbosity has obscured what I'm really trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is if you have a country, any country, particularly a huge and complex country like ours, where no, there is no other, there's no unifying fact, okay? Most countries have... Settle down for a second. I'll, I'll be right there. <laughs> Most, con you know, do you know what I mean? Like that's we, that is a potentially a vulnerability for us. I don't think it needs to be, but we need to address it thoughtfully. You have to have, of course. I'm not. I, I'm totally opposed to stamping out anybody's culture. You're telling anyone what to believe. I'm just saying the very most obvious thing, which you must have something in common with everyone else in your country, or why would you be a country? And if you don't think that, you haven't thought about it very much.